God is good. And all the time, God is good. And our message this morning is based on Psalm 111, as well as 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright, in the congregation, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And from 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, in an uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on the throne today. And now... O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of people, the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and you have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your Lord, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
God is good? And all the time, God is good. The message is entitled, The Sins of the Father. Now, we've all heard the expression, like father, like son. And to a large extent, I, I think there's a great deal of truth to these kind of words. Much of who we are is what we've learned from our parents during those formative years. And for instance, if a parent smokes or drinks in front of their children, the chances are pretty good that when that child grows up, he or she, when they become an adult, is probably going to follow in the footsteps of the parents and also smoke or drink. Now, if a son witnesses his father beaten up uh, his, and being abusive to his mother, when he grows up, chances are good that he'll also in turn be physically abusive to his, his wife and, and his children. Now, in our lesson from 1 Kings, we can plainly see that in many ways, Solomon also walked pretty closely in the footsteps of his father, David. Now, some of the footsteps are good, but some of them were kind of bad. We're told Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, David, only he sacrificed incense at the high places. Now, Solomon might have walked in the footsteps of his father, but he also had this bigger is better complex. Uh, basically, he was a spoiled rich kid. Now, if you remember David's early days in his father-in-law's court, Saul was the first king of Israel, David married Saul's daughter, Michal, after slaying the, uh, the giant Goliath. But after he fled Saul's court, because Saul was determined to kill him, Saul became jealous of David. Uh, I heard the people saying that, you know, Saul's killed, you know, his thousand, David his, you know, ten thousands. Um, Saul gets jealous. Uh, and so David flees from Saul's court. And Michal's left behind, and her daddy promptly marries her off to another man. Now, according to 1 Samuel 25, 44, Saul had given his daughter Michal to, you know, who's David's wife, to Palti, uh, son of Laash, who was from Gilam. Anyhow, when David became king of Israel, he demands that his wife be given back to him, even although by this time she's happily married, you know, to another man. Now, David's reason most likely was because Michal was his legal claim to Saul's throne. And you can be sure Solomon recognized this. Now, in the second chapter, we're told that when Solomon's conniving brother, Ad Adonijah, uh, who had just lost his bid for the kingdom, he comes to Solomon's mother, and he, he coyly asks whether or not uh, she would help him in helping to make a bishabag, uh, the Shumanite, who was David's last concubine. Remember the story? David's basically dying, so they, they find this beautiful young girl and have her snuggle up to him, but, you know, it doesn't do any good. He's past caring about that sort of thing. But anyhow, Solomon, a real, you know, immediately recognizes that what Adonijah was doing was this was basically, you know, a backdoor play for, for the throne. <clears throat> and so he promptly has Adonijah killed who even though he's his own brother. But he also uses these circumstances to politically distance himself from Bathsheba, his mother, who up until this time figured pretty heavily in the ruling of the kingdom. Now, we're also told that David had more than one wife. Well, Solomon apparently liked that because he had considerably more. In the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, we're told just how prone Solomon was to excess in this area and, and actually what it ultimately does cost him. King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning whom the Lord has said to the Israelites, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. Now Solomon clung to these in love. Among his wives were 700 princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not true to the Lord his God, as was the heart his father David." For Solomon followed Astarte, the goddess of the Sidians, and Macom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, 
and did not completely follow the Lord as his father David had done. Then Solomon built a high place for, for Shemesh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who offered incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now, like his father David, Solomon was a pretty astute king when it came to the affairs of state. However, when it came to the affairs of the heart, he's pretty much a loser. Uh, he might have had more wisdom than any other man uh, who ever lived, but he didn't have common sense when it came to relationships. Now, all the wisdom of the world is only going to take you so far when you let your heart stray from, you know, following the Lord God. If you put God first in your life, your, wor your world is going to be infinitely better than if you don't. Now, King David's major claim to glory uh, was the relationship with the Lord. And over and over again, we read that David was a man after God's own heart. Solomon, apparently not so much. If it hadn't been for that stupid census, if it hadn't been for, you know, messing around Bathsheba, if it hadn't been for murdering Bathsheba's wife, David would have been a pretty awesome king. Now, I think the best gift any of us could ever give our children would be insight on how we can have a really good relationship with our God. Now, it might be true that they might pick up easily the pattern of their parents' lives, and start living their lives after the sins of their father or their mother, our children and those who follow us will also pick up the relationship that we have with our God. If they see us reading their Bible, they'll probably read theirs. If they see us in prayer, seeking the Lord for, for wisdom in, in daily matters, they'll probably also seek the Lord as well. But if we say one thing and then do another, those who follow us will probably take notice and do likewise with their lives. Now, if we're lax about how we keep our financial house, if we don't pay our bills on time, those who follow us will probably also do likewise. If we have a work ethic, our children will probably have a work ethic as well. But if we treat others with contempt, if we talk about them behind their backs, our children will probably do likewise. But if we stand on the principles outlined in God's holy word, those who follow us will surely do likewise. Now, our commitment to our God and our integrity in serving him in spirit as well as truth will become a steady stay and guide to those who, who follow us. Now, instead of picking up on our sins, those who follow us will build upon the sure foundation they found securely built in our lives. Now, in 1789, William Wilber Wilberforce stood before the British Parliament and he eloquently cried out for the day when men, women, and children would not be sold in the, part, in the marketplace like farm animals. And for the next 18 years, year after year, he'd bring up the bill and it'd be defeated. But finally, in 1933, just four days before his death, the Parliament passed a bill completely abolishing slavery. William Wilberforce is not remembered for the 18 years he failed to get that through the Parliament. But finally, the victory that he had in having slavery abolished in England. Now, Wilberforce, he was known for championing causes. At one time, he actually championed up to 69 causes at one time. He gave away one quarter of his wealth to, you know, to the poor. He fought on behalf of chimney sweeps, of orphans, juvenile delinquents, Sunday schools. He helped form church groups like the Society for Bettering the Cause of the Poor, uh, Church Missionary Society, that's something he started, the British Foreign and, and Bible Society, as well as the Anti-Slavery Society. But you know, I heard early in his life that some of his friends were actually slave traders. But he's not remembered for that. He's remembered for helping to get rid of slavery. None of us will ever be remembered for the faults that we found in others, but we'll be remembered in the way in which we overcame our own. None of us will ever be honored by having a critical eye, for discovering the faults that are in other people's, but instead on how we could live our lives as a life of honor 
and commitment to the Lord our God and how we can make our lives serve as a concrete illustration of God's love. A drunk man who smelled like alcohol, he sits down on a subway seat next to a priest. I mean, this guy's a wreck. His tie's stained, his face is plastered, you know, with, with lipstick, and he's got a bottle of half, you know, empty gin sticking out of his, his pocket. And he sits down next to this priest, he starts reading the newspaper. Well, after a few minutes, the man turns to the priest and he says, Hey, Father, what causes arthritis? Well, the priest is just livid, sitting next to this, this drunk. And he says, My son, it's caused by loose living, by being with cheap, wicked women, by too much alcohol, and a contempt for your fellow man. And the drunk says, Well, I'll be darned. And he returned to read his paper. Well, the priest began to feel sorry for the way he had, you know, lashed out at this fellow. And, you know, he didn't have any right to judge him. I mean, he didn't know anything about his story. And so he turned to me and he apologized. He said, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to come on so strong. How long, how long have you had arthritis, my son? And the drunk turned to the priest. He says, Father, I don't have arthritis. I'm just reading here in the, in the paper that the Pope does. It's always such a temptation to point out all the warts, all the glitches, all the failures of other people. <coughs> but we would do well to remember, you know, the apple doesn't always fall that far from the tree. You and I should be proud of our heritage. We should always be proud of the accomplishments of our ancestors who went before us. But we also need to recognize that the sins of the Father, they really don't need to be passed down to the next generation. Each and every one of us must take charge of our own lives. None of us will ever, be, will ever stand in judgment before the Lord our God for the sins of our fathers or, or our mothers. We'll have enough to do pleading the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for our own life, our own failures, and recognizing that He truly is Lord and Savior of our lives. Now the psalmist writes that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice, practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Now, as near as we can tell, Solomon used his great wisdom not to serve the Lord as much as perhaps to serve his own, his own gain. Now, his son, Rehoboam, succeeds him. And sadly, it seems the sins of the father were apparent in Solomon's heir. Now, shortly after ascending to the throne, this spoiled rich kid he practically gives the kingdom away by, you know, some of his stupid um, judgments and things that he, he pulled. Instead of, you know, decreasing the burden on the people with taxes, he, he doubles it, and, and they revolted, and it split the northern and southern kingdoms. Ten tribes, the northern, uh, ten tribes of Israel, and then you get the southern two. But from that point on, every king of Israel as well as Judah would pretty much have a, a rough hoe, you know, row to hoe. Now, according, uh, with very few exceptions, see, things always seem to go from bad to worse with each and every successive king. And none of them would ever rule as vast a country as did David or Solomon, you know, before them. But you know, from their lives, there's a lot that we can learn. What we should take away, I think, from their success as well as their failure as leaders of, you know, of, of people, leaders of, of a kingdom, is that the relationship that they have with their God, it made itself known in every other aspect of their lives, including the lives of their children. Now today, just like Solomon, as well as every other son or daughter, we need to choose whether or not we're going to place more value on things or upon the relationships that God has given to us in his life. Now sadly, Solomon, as well as just about everyone that followed them as king in their stead, chose things over the relationship. And, and in particular, they, they chose, you know, wealth and, and ease over walking with the Lord God. And so their legacy really is one of strife and want. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is, which way will we turn? 
as we live out our lives. Will we continue the sins of human nature by living in the sins of the Father? Or, or will we strive for the righteousness of, of the Lord our God? For in the Lord are blessings upon blessings. And if we just live our lives for Jesus, then, then everything else seems to start falling in its place. Actually, having less might actually be having more. Possessions have a way of owning people. And if your possessions are things that turn your heart from God, maybe you need to consider getting rid of them and putting other things that, that help us in our, in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. The simple, unadorned truth is our lives really are up to us. Our future is up to us. Today, I would encourage you to choose life in Christ Jesus and that ever-renewing future that this kind of relationship always holds. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we do pray. Pray, Lord, that walking with you would become not just second nature, but also, Lord, the goal and the desire of our lives. When Solomon pleaded to you, Lord, for great wisdom so that he might rule the people, you came through. But the problem is, he did not. And he followed after the things of the world. We're praying, O oh God, that as we learn what it means to walk with you in spirit and truth, Lord, that you might reveal an even better way to us, that we might walk even closer. We pray for that great blessing, which begets, begats other blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.